Welcome back. This is Dr. Aeronautics, and we're going to begin a new tutorial series now on uh, the Delta Glider 4, and we're going to do it in Orbiter 2010 for two reasons. One, I'm tired of the 2016 bugs that I've been getting, and other than the 3D terrain, not really that much of an improvement. Uh, the other bigger reason is because a lot of the add-ons that go with the Delta Glider 4, like uh, I think it's CGO, uh, are not compatible with uh, Orbiter 2016 yet. And uh, you can get the same version for 2016 that you got for 2010, because there's been no update yet. Boy. Okay, so this is the website you want to go to. Uh, it is orbiter.danstuff.com, and this is his page where you get all the goodies from. Um, the most important thing, and the really only, well, that's not true. You definitely, definitely want to get the Orbiter Sound 4.0 uh, in addition to the Delta Glider. So uh, go ahead and click Download, and then you'll see the downloads. So there it is, the Delta Glider 4-3 with UMMU 3.0. That is your Red Rider BB gun. Uh, yeah, it's really amazing. Adds a lot of functionality to the game. There's also other things that you can get. I suggest Orbiter Sound 3.5 because I don't like 4, but it works. You can also get UCGO 3.0, but it's not compatible with Orbiter 2016 yet. There's been no update released on it. This is really cool because you also get the Aero Freighter, um, the Aero Mothership Freighter, and then you also get like little cars that you can drive around. And uh, it's, it's really great. Uh, everything in that little screenshot yet so like for example here here's a picture of the captain's uh office in the mothership you know it's pretty cool and that that mothership the arrow this guy that's my go-to when i'm flying interplanetary space i pair a delta glider for and or a xr2 um to this ship and i go anywhere i feel like uh it's it's really great and it really simulates realism at its you know maximum possible potential. So yeah, all you need to do is just um, go ahead and click that download button, and uh, once you click download, you'll be on your way. Here's actually a a picture of a, a UMMU actually manned person like an avatar that you can control with your joystick like it's a real person uh, moving some cargo on the ship. So when you click download, it'll install like any other installer. All you got to do is just tell it where Orbiter is installed and it will do the rest of the work for you. Uh, as soon as you open it up, it should open up the configuration for you, but I'm going to go over that next since I have that already installed again definitely get Orbiter Sound because you'll get so much more out of this uh, if you just click that download button. Okay, this is the configuration that should open by default uh, when you download the Delta Glider 4. If not, it's in, I believe it's in, it's either in the dock folder or it's in the uh, main folder. I might have moved it around. But look at the different options you have. You know, you can go all the way to four years and it's down, far down to seven days of oxygen. Uh, I believe lower, yeah, lower is definitely more realistic, but I don't know which one is the fully realistic. That's 15 day or seven day. That's with a full five man crew. So if you go with the four years, uh, like you're going to the outer planets and you only have one person, that quintuples, you get five years of oxygen, or yeah, uh, no, 20 years of oxygen, uh, which should be enough time to get to Neptune and back if you're really fast. So yeah, um, when, when I'm not doing something that requires that, like I'm on the mothership, I might pick a smaller amount, but the default, I think, is two years. I think that's how that's supposed to work. And then you also are able to choose the amount of fuel that you get. And uh, 
you can choose anything from realistic, which is only to basically the ISS, or a mothership if you have one parked in orbit, like I like to do. Um, sometimes it's fun to play with realism because then you really have to be it. Short, short put, it makes you a lot better of a pilot. Default will be as much as the stock Delta glider. Huge will send you all the way to Jupiter. Now you can't go just to Jupiter because Jupiter is such a gravity well that doing any maneuvers there is actually worse than going further out into the solar system because the planets are smaller. So even though Saturn is farther away from the sun, it's a smaller planet. It's easier to fly. And then same with Uranus. Further out, smaller planet. Neptune, further out, smaller planet. So uh, the, most, the biggest fuel that you're ever going to have any mission whatsoever, unless you're doing something insane, is going to be at Jupiter. So if you pick Jupiter... That's the entire solar system. Mars will let you get to Mars, basically. Um, there is no scram jets, so that's important to note. And then you can choose your fuel uh, power. So in kilonewtons. So Mark 1 is kind of weak, uh, all the way up to the Mark 5 with a really, really powerful engine. I do a lot of flight in the upper atmospheres of the gas giant planets, which means I need something that's really good with high pressure. Um, it needs a high thrust or high pressure thrust chamber. So the Mark V is typically what I go with. And uh, that's the reason why. You can also fly around faster, but the main reason is that higher thrust chamber pressure. Allowed docking refuel will actually allow you to transfer fuel slowly and realistically from a docked object such as a mothership or the International Space Station. This is a lot more realistic because. It happens slowly. It's not insta-fill, like auto-refuel on pad is. So that's um, also worth noting. Okay, so now next we have a few configuration items on safety. So ship and pilot are on vulnerable chicken mode. I really don't like to check this box here because it kind of defeats the entire purpose of the Delta Glider 4, which is making it, so-called, a little bit more realistic. Even though, you know, I don't like to do that. But if you pull a 9G turn, or if you crash into the ground, the uh, ship becomes un uncontrollable. It explodes. Uh, ship never burn on re-entry uh, for chicken mode is a little bit different than this one. Uh, basically, if you re-enter with a 10 degree angle, and you hit 2500 degrees on you know, the graph, which is more than the hull can take, um, you will rupture the hull, and you will be exploded immediately. So uh, enable ground uh, cockpit head effect and uh, some of this other stuff here. I'm. Uh, it, it's up to you. It's really performance. Same thing with uh, the amount of debris that you get. And, uh, yeah, the heat, the re, the re entry heat shield will kind of light, light up. And there's also the performance, like the amount of debris that you can add. I just leave it alone because I've gotten so good at flying at the Delta Glider 4, um, that I haven't needed to use it, uh, recently. So I really don't care. I just kind of leave it where it is. But in case I do mess up, you see it there. Uh, you also have the visual smoke settings and the, um, Gas. Gas will actually um, flow out of the ship. Um, so anyway, if you uh, click this main and hover thrust, you can see, based on how good your computer is, you know, you can completely disable all the visual effects of the smoke, or you can enable all of it. And you can also um, disable for fuel and engine, or enable, because there are actually several points, like there, and there, and a few other locations, where fuel will actually come out of, and uh, gas will come out of, uh, perfectly normal, but uh, part of the system is how the ship operates. So yeah, that's pretty much it. You can get to the Delta Glider 4 documentation there, or you can click the documentation display there. And there's information on... Uh, it's in the doc folder. There's information on uh, the checklists and the master computer and full documentation.
So uh, let's jump into the simulation and see what she's got. Okay, so once you have it installed, you can open the orbiter launch pad just like you would for the Delta Glider stock version. And just below Delta Glider, you'll see Delta Glider 4. And you can open up any one of the uh, scenarios that you want. And so, I recommend the ones that aren't tutorial if you're just starting out, you know, you can see everything. So here she is. This is the Delta Glider 4. And as you can see, a lot is different than the stock Delta Glider. Uh, it's a really fantastic craft that you have to fly. So let's learn this machine, shall we? Wow, look at that, right? You have a completely different, uh, a different, completely different display. And I'm basically gonna go through the entire manual to, very quickly, to describe all of the amazing uh, capabilities of this craft. So, to sum up, despite its futuristic look uh, and the fact that it supposedly contains technology is impossible, I don't like it, using the word impossible for uh, technology. I like to use the word unseeable uh, because I'm pretty sure that the cavemen uh, in the Pleistocene would say that it's impossible to communicate with someone who's a hundred days away by walking within a second. So, so I don't consider technology being possible. This is one of the most realistic ships that you can fly in orbiter, which is why it's, it's what I fly normally. Uh, if I were a real life airline captain, this would be, well, I'd choose the XR2 but the Delta Glider force closing. So you now have to worry about your crew and you can't claim a successful flight with uh, really ridiculous things like 90 degree re-entry angles or, uh, or 20 Gs or if you crash or you run out of fuel, um, you are done for. So that being said, uh, let's take a look at what this craft is capable of. One thing that I must note is uh, this craft has done away with the uh, with the scramjets. These two intakes here, these are not scramjets. These are oxidizer intakes. See, the, and these two things here are for uh, are for radiating the craft's temperature. There is no scramjets, so just be mindful of that. Remember, I said. In one of the previous tutorials, I choose XR2 Raven Stars for atmospheres, and I choose Delta Glider 4s for for vacuums. And the reason that is is because of the scram jets. The XR2 scram jets are incredible. Takeoff speed has been increased from 160 to 180 meters per second, and the landing speed is about 175 meters per second. One of the most important things that you can possibly do when you load a uh, Delta Glider 4 is renew the settings from the configurator. So if I do control down arrow, suddenly you see the extended panel, which is a lot more realistic. And now you have some information, such as the name, the actual scenario named craft. If I open up the, uh, the information here, you can actually see this is the name of the craft. It's the GL-01. Uh, some information such as the engine you're using and the dry power, your reserves. And you might say, hey, this doesn't match up. The reason is because you haven't loaded the configuration settings. So the settings are overridden by default in the scenario file. The scenario file actually controls 
what the levels of the craft are. Now that's to be a little bit more realistic, but if you want to force override, just hit load setting. And now you see O2 engine and fuel setting loading from Delta G4 config.exe loaded okay. And this is what I'm talking about, where you get status messages. Now that's changed to Mars, so we're all set. Control up arrow will get you back to console. There's a lot of keyboard commands that you should review in the menu. Uh, just to demonstrate, if I do uh, D62, that's going to actually run a diagnostic on the craft. Another reason why I really like that. D62. And basically what this is telling me is that we're not configured for orbit. But that's expected because we're not going to be in orbit. Now I can also check for takeoff. Configuration correct. And that means that we can take off immediately if we felt like it. And remember that one time where the, uh, the door got ripped off during takeoff and I got really ticked off because of that? Well, if I could just run the D61. Configuration correct. I would realize that the hatch was open, right? And uh, let's go ahead and demonstrate that right now by opening the nose cone. If I was to open the nose cone and then attempt to take off, then it's going to complain. And then if I continue to take off, I will lose the nose cone. D61. And now it's telling you that the nose cone isn't closed. So that's extremely important. This is the ship's master computer, by the way. So another thing that I don't think I can demonstrate because I don't think these things show up, but if you can get to the scenario editor and now edit your craft, just like I said before, now you will have three sections down here dedicated to the Delta Glider. The Delta Glider 4 Repaint Center, the Payload Center, and the Passenger Center. So if you click that, it just simply allows you to choose your skin and then it's saved in the drop-down. Unfortunately, there's no back navigation, which means now I have to reopen it again. There's also payload center, so you can select UCGO cargos, or you can select Delta Glider 4 cargos. Uh, I'm pretty sure, it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure that you can actually consume, consume uh, materials that are in your craft so you can actually load space fuel and have more fuel on board. You can also name and give the age and role of your different passengers. There's a whole bunch of roles from passenger all the way down to VIP and there's like 20 different roles that you can take. And you can leave it blank for no roles. Possibly the most important thing, there's actually a manual on this itself, are checklists. If I come down here, you'll see there's this checklist display menu. And if I navigate between them, you'll see the different checklists that are available. If I hit menu, it'll go straight to the menu. If I've chosen one, such as ground cockpit startup, now I can navigate through it and it will actually tell you everything that you need to do to get the craft ready. Now the question is you have to be able to identify your state. The best way to do that is with the main flight computer running a, a diagnostic check and seeing how you're configured. Uh, generally there's these crazy things like safe mode and power off cockpit. Safe mode is a lot different than what it is in real life. In real life, when a spacecraft is in safe mode, that's very similar to the fetal position or uh, being unconscious. When you talk about a spacecraft being in safe mode, it's generally protecting itself from harm due to a outside influence. So spacecraft in safe modes is considered an anomalous condition in real life. But in... Um, the world of the Delta Glider 4, it's actually considered safe. So generally, if you want to attach this to a mothership, you can put it in sleep mode 
and this will disable temperature check. So if you want to launch to a rocket or um, come in with a, uh, with a heat shield, which is, that's how I re-enter to the uh, outer planets, is I use a re-entry shield. And that will allow me to re-enter and even do an aero capture and then you'll jettison this later. So to do that, you go into safe mode and it completely disables, it disables the oxygen usage too, which notice we're actually using. And right now uh, we have 13 months of oxygen on board, which is kind of interesting because it says our maximum O2 reserve is two years. Oh, of course we have, uh, two tanks. We have an A tank and a B tank. So if you add these two reserves, you get 26, uh, 26 months worth. Now I'm just going to review the overall panel. So the seat belt is actually important because it controls whether or not your uh, crew is wearing uh, their seat belts or not. Notify that uh, you can't see an interior cockpit display. So the only way that you can see your crew is through here. You're wearing your seat belts, which means you're also wearing your uh, your spacesuits. So if I turn seat belts off, and we take a look again, uh, now they are not wearing their spacesuits. So this is extremely important because now you can't eject. You can actually eject. There is a hatch here that will remove, and these side panels are bailout panels that, that blow out and allow people to escape. So just note that uh, while your seatbelt is off, you can't safely bail out. And if for some reason some dangerous thing were to happen, like say say the uh, airlock blew out and you uh, encountered a depressurization, you will not be safe. If you're wearing your seatbelts, now the interior can go vacuum and it's not going to harm the crew members. The next thing uh, that we can go to is the uh, airlock. So in the case of the airlock, you can actually uh, empty and pressurize your airlock. So there are two doors and it's the same deal with the Delta glider, except if, if we were in space, now what we would want to do is press this EMP button but you can't do it because we're in an atmosphere. So that's worth knowing. If it was vacuum outside, then we could depressurize. We'd essentially dump the air out and then we could open the outer door, which by the way, it's telling you what's going on. And then we'll receive a status message once it's open. See, open, there you go. And now you can see into the airlock. Uh, there's also gear hydraulic pressure, just as there is with uh, airplanes. Most airplanes have the positions of down, off, and up. Generally, uh, with this craft, you have down and up. So after moving the gear, you want to turn the hydraulic pressure off. And now this is most interesting. If I turn the HUD off, which is uh, right here. There you go. I powered the HUD down. This is something new. Power management. You can actually activate and deactivate parts of your ship's systems, which will conserve power. Right now, there's no there's no external or internal power source which is going to run out. But in order to simulate consumables uh, on longer missions, I'll actually power down some of these systems. So right now the MFD is functioning. We power that down and see what happens. Six, we just lost six amps. And now our MFDs are dysfunctional. By the way, you'll note that there's actually four MFDs available. So we can bring up four MFDs at the same time, which feel like it. We can also disable radio. And now the radio system is offline. If I disable airlock, now we can't mess with our airlock because there's no power on the bus. So that's a little bit about that. You can also disable and enable generators. 
Uh, and you can also pause yourself faults. Like if I want to change to generator two, now there's a power fault because uh, generator two is not online. And if I change that, we still have a fault. So you actually have to reset these breakers by turning them off and back on again. So now we actually have to reboot the uh, craft ship's master computer because there was a power fault. So that's a little bit uh, worth knowing too. So that's a little bit about power management. I could also uh, connect a battery and disable both generators and be okay. I can also connect an uh, external power unit. You only need 48 volt to run the craft, but if you add the two, two generators, you get to 96 volts. Otherwise, the bus will run on 48 volts. Right now, this bat charge basically means that we're charging the battery. We could also run on simply the battery too, if, uh, if we had to, but the battery, I think, has a lifetime limitation. Over here, your strobe basically controls whether or not your lights are on or off. So yeah, now if I come down here, you'll notice actually there are caution and warning lights. I'm not gonna go over what all these are, but these actually work. And that's why I really like this craft, is because it actually has testable warning lights. You'll notice a lot more change here. You have atmospheric control, which will automatically switch back and forth between RCS. And, um, and control. You also rotation. have your rotation translation translation available here. Notice the different call out. Elevon. Pitch Elevon. So here's your two ones combined into one. I'll control off. And you can actually disable your control as well. You also have a secondary HUD if I power that guy back up again. You'll see that uh, there are different modes here and some of these aren't actually configured. So to to go down in number, you left click, and to go up in number, you right click. So right now, I actually don't have HUDs 4 or 5 configured, and I could actually configure it based on what I want to see. How useful is that? Uh, generally, 3 is used for atmospheric flight. It'll actually convert things to miles per hour and feet for people who can't deal with that. Or when you're trying to uh, actually fly a civilian aviation profile. Uh, two is really important for ascent and uh, and re-entry because your vessel mass controls how, how your re-entry uh, changes. And then uh, let's see if some other stuff around here. So this, this is the system messaging center which you can reset uh, if you get an alarm, like like if I were to trigger, if I were to trigger an alarm, then you would actually see this in the ship's master warning alarm, and then you'd get a reset. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to trigger an alarm just on the surface. Uh, the easiest way would probably be to uh, force a bailout. Which I don't want to do because then I won't be able to control the ship. Down here, there's also a remote control thrust, which works with the remote control configurator. So I can actually say, let's say we want to set a burn that lasts nine minutes and nine seconds, and it's going to occur um, seven minutes from now. Uh oh. But look at this. This is the life support system. Right now, our uh, cabin air recycling system is offline. So what does this mean? This actually means that we're going to lose out on our oxygen. So let's take a look at that. We want to look at the uh, cabin light display here. And you'll see that the uh, CO2 level is rising because we're no longer scrubbing oxygen. We're at 604 parts per million, and that's pretty bad. So we've now encountered real life supported system uh, materials. If I actually didn't do anything, I'd be a little bit screwed. So let's go ahead and restart the primary system. And there we go, we're recovering now. We're now scrubbing 
carbon dioxide again. If I didn't do anything, eventually we would just uh, get a message that says, you're unconscious, dummy, and we'll basically die. Okay, so nine minutes is uh, right there and nine seconds. And conveniently, it gives you seconds, which is what the most convenient SI unit is when calculating your burn times. And uh, let's do the same for the... Um, so if I were to start this in nine minutes and nine seconds, there would be a burn that is nine minutes and nine seconds long, and I can select the power level, which is really handy. And you hit start or stop, and it will count down to burn, and you can now see here is the readout of time to burn and then once you're burning time remaining in the burn very handy okay uh, the last thing is your trim control which looks a little bit different than the uh, stock delta glider you actually can't click it here which means you're going to have to learn the keys insert and delete to modify this you can also use the uh, autopilot to do this for you. Okay, so let's come down here. We went over the checklist display. Uh, the next thing we can go over, uh, let me see, we went over this too. Let's go back to the life support system, right? So in here are four cryogenic tanks with oxygen, with uh, atmosphere for you. So if I disable them, again, to turn counterclockwise, left click to turn clockwise, right click. I've now turned the system off, so we're not being fed oxygen. So over time, uh, our oxygen level will begin decreasing, and there you go, because we're breathing. A really easy way to fix that would be, uh, let me see if I can figure out where it is real quickly. Uh, there's a lot through here. Oh, that's right. That that air won't open yet. I turned the airlock off. Okay, so our airlock is opening now, and now you can see there's a great change in uh, both temperature and moisture because we're now being exposed to the Florida air. So all that carbon dioxide that is uh, stuffed in has now left because our craft is now open to the environment, so the air can just flow right in. Okay, so uh, I can actually refill these tanks from the, uh, from the atmosphere. Right now it's disabled, uh, but if I enable the external valve, I can actually fill these tanks up. And there you go, I've just topped them off. Now I can turn them back on. Don't forget to disable that valve when you're done. Can only do that when you're on the ground. You can also change your cabin set points, like uh, I'm not going to go into details, but change the pressure in here, you can change the oxygen, you can change the temperature, and uh, somewhere in here you'll have a um, you'll have some information on that. You have primary and redundant tanks, you have primary and redundant systems, but note that if you use one tank, then you only have half the amount of time. But you could do a tank cross feed. That can. Okay. The next thing I'm going to go over is the fuel and engine. Cover your ears. We're going to call a fuel truck. I just opened the fuel hatch. Watch the external pressure. Okay, a truck has now connected itself to the system. But before we fill it, look at how useful this is. If I want to fuel my, if I want to fill my main tanks, I can fill it based on my RCS. Look at this. See, cross feeding. You can't do that in the stock Delta glider. So if you not useless fuel here that you'd like to use as like a pony tank to keep yourself alive, you can cross it. And it goes both ways too. 
So this controls your some of your information here. Uh, there's hover valves and RCS valves and main valves. So they're pretty straightforward. If RCS is off, your, R, your RCS won't work. If hover's off, your hover won't work. That's extremely important. Don't forget that. Uh, let's see. An auto air intake will actually inject some oxidizer into the, into the tanks for you. Uh, which will actually increase your increase your value, and if you activate this turbo pump, you'll gain an extra power. Um, again, which is why you want to uh, use this for uh, non-atmospheric flight, it's because it's just simply increasing power. It adds something like 15% of the 15% um, of the power to the main valves. So even though it'll say 360, um, 360, what is it? Oh, and here's another great thing is, is the powers list here. Even though it'll say 320 kilonewtons, uh, it is actually going to be a little bit more than that because you have this turbo pump and that can be used for an emergency, such as if you realize, oh my gosh, I'm on a collision course with IO, get me out of here. Well, you can add the turbo pump, and it will give you an emergency 15% more power for an, for an indefinite amount of time. You'll lose delta V doing it um, because it's not as efficient, but you will uh, have a greater chance of escaping certain death by impact. You can also open and close doors, right? talked about retro doors look at that but this craft actually has hover doors which means there's two things to worry about you have to worry about the valve being on and you have to worry about the door being on. and there you go so if you leave it on auto then whenever you turn the thrust on it will automatically turn on for you I should be able to demonstrate this real quick with the um, retro doors. Set that back to auto and add a little bit of hover thrust. Check this out. Yep, there you go. Okay, so next we can talk about the main flight computer. There are nine uh, functions that this computer can do, and I'm not going to explain everything, but some of the most important things are the uh, deorbiting display, which is used to calculate the correct angle so that you don't burn up in the atmosphere. Yes, you will burn up if you don't get this information right. I think it's between 0.5 degrees and 4 degrees is your angle to use. D3, here is your master display for re-entering, right? Well, everything is important. Your dynamic pressure, your maximum G-force, because it determines your survivability, and the hull temperatures. You cannot exceed the hull temperature limits, or you will die. If we go to checklist 15, you'll see what those are. Here are the max temperatures. Nose which is this one, 2200, wings, 2200, bottom hole, 2200, cockpit, 1300. Top hole is actually not displayed on the screen, but it's generally low as long as you don't flip the craft upside down. That's what I was saying with the stock delta glider. You do a steeper than 90 degree bank so that you're now facing the planet, you're gonna burn up. With any doors open, those are your limitations, which means don't open the doors on Venus, because Venus is hotter than 350 degrees centigrade. You can also display some electrical information on the craft. Uh, 
I went over five. You can check for damage. So there's no damage systems. That's full diagnostics there. Uh, you can also program materials here, like um, if I want to. These these are the different autopilots that you use, right? So you can actually do a taxi bolt speed approach, a flight, docking, atmospheric flight, earth ascent, auto reentry. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of autopilots. There's also a calculator that you can use. Whoops. I forgot I need to use the uh, 5 plus 5, and the result is 10. Look at that. So I might actually use some of this. You can even do uh, square roots and a lot of other really neat things with this thing. And you have an external high gain antenna, which can uh, deploy out of this right here. So let's see, we're almost done. The next thing I'm actually going to talk about is actually the long range antenna. So let's power up the radio system and take a look at this thing. So how does a craft communicate when you're very, very far? I'm talking AUs from the Earth. You can't do it the way an airplane does with an omnidirectional antenna that's embedded into the craft. You actually have to deploy what's known as a high gain antenna to maintain contact with something. And you can actually choose this thing to target any particular thing to get information on it. So, for example, that's yeah, a way for it to deploy. Hey, Houston, we see our targets. Uh, we have a go for GPS incorporation. Okay, we'll load. And it's going to conveniently stow for no particular reason because you can't use this thing in an atmosphere. This is for space only. That's one of your deployments that you'll have to do on orbit. And I can choose anything that's loaded in here. Anything at all. I can target anything I want. I can change different modes. I can even turn it off. So right now I've turned it off. Okay, the last thing to review is the uh, UMFU Turbo Packs. So you can actually use uh, universal man units uh, if I do this right. Okay, uh, auto, uh, GPS, and pass the backup. This is a turbo pack. You can install it to yourself. It's basically a jet set. So now you can uh, come over here and put this uh, jet set on your back, and then you can jet pack everywhere with it. In space. Houston, if you like that attitude, me, we load it in, we'll give you the item 19. I don't really have to say anything Okay, we'll else. hold off and maneuver on your call. Shut up. I turned the radio off. Okay, there is a cargo bay. In this cargo bay, you can store up to four units of cargo or a single unit of Delta Glider 4 material. Okay, if you had oxygen or fuel loaded on board, let me do that really quickly. I go to uh, custom scenario editor, edit, and uh, let's see, it's payload center, and let's load a oxygen cargo once it opens. Okay, there's an oxygen, and let's own, add a space fuel. We got oxygen, we got space fuel. So in here, I could do use fuel uh, or use oxygen, but Thank goodness the thing is smart enough to realize, hey, your tanks are full. This isn't going to do anything. There, it's very important to learn how to manage these things properly because these containers do weigh something empty. So as soon as you're done using them, you want to eject them. And you can do this with the release. See, now I've actually released this and it sets it down, which is really nice. In space, you can't do that. You can only... Um, add some velocity component to it. There's a few other things here too, like the radiator and uh, Windows Ray filters, which are used to protect against the sun. And you can even arm ejection seats too. But here's the really cool thing, right? I'm gonna EVA this guy. Now he's actually jumped out to see him. And now if I select him, it's safe 
to take a spacesuit off. I'm now a human walking around the craft. Isn't this cool? I can actually walk around my craft as a human avatar and inspect. Pretty darn cool, isn't it? Oh, and by the way, this gas that's coming out of the craft, yeah, you can turn that off by hitting the right switch. So some additional notes that I want to go over real quickly. G-forces are extremely important when flying this craft. You cannot exceed the G-limits. You'll get G-lock if uh, you hold nine Gs for over two to three seconds, okay? And you will die if you hold more than 12 Gs for um, about eight seconds. And you will die if you hold seven Gs for any extended period of time longer than 30 seconds. So that's extremely worth noting. You also have a heart rate monitor inside that you can use too. And um, that's pretty much it. So make sure you look into the uh, documentation for some information on setting the cabin temperatures and pressures correctly. Temperatures are not as important, but you can also set oxygen percentages. Like if you're if you're uh, using too much oxygen, you need to conserve oxygen. You can control how much oxygen goes into the cabin for an amount. It'll also list all your autopilots, uh, like the Mars Ascent autopilot and other things. You can even create your own autopilots. There's also uh, some nice calculators uh, that you can uh, calculated uh, scripts that you can run in the uh, in the system, and it looks like that the Prelude Two base is included. So let's take a look at the Prelude Two base real quick, since you're going to get this. I actually haven't had much use for it because um, I don't know why, but you can actually do UMMU with this. I create this. And it's a lot like a, um, a base, or, or a vessel, except it's a base. And I can stick this anywhere. Let's stick it on Enceladus. Look at that. We just created a base, just like that, on Saturn, Moon, Enceladus. And you can land here. You can actually dial in the ILS, land here, and then park your craft underneath this hangar to protect it from outer space. And then you can go inside the craft, and you can actually do things inside here. I say craft, I mean base. Uh, let's select it. And now we're inside of it. This is the remote control. And if I hit enter, you've now got a base menu. And I can do anything I want. I can open or close the airlock, see who's on board. I can store people here. I can store cargo here. I can even configure the... Um, the pad, I can choose its appearance. Look at that. I've just changed its color. And I've changed its color again. That handy. You can also randomly load crew and do a few extra things that aren't shown here, like uh, here's changing cameras that you can do as well. So that's it. I will see you guys for the first tutorial. Uh, if this seems like something that you're interested in, definitely download it. This is the, the second most... You know what? If I consider everything, UGCO, the Arrow, the Prelude 2 base, Delta Lighter 4, this is the single most amazing thing and awesome thing uh, about Orbiter Space Flight Simulator. This is what I do, normally. Uh, and I also use the XR2 Raven Star, which can also be used as well. We'll have our own tutorial series on that as well. Thank you guys for joining me, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.